Today we're going to talk about using the Micro Four Thirds camera system for landscape photography. So I'm predominantly a Nikon shooter as we've covered in previous videos, but occasionally I break out a Micro Four Thirds camera for maybe when I'm traveling with the family when photography is definitely not the primary reason to be out. I like to have a small little camera with me with a little bit of versatility. Or, as I'm starting to do more so recently, when I'm doing some exploratory hikes, whether it be a strenuous hike that's a lot of up and down, or maybe I'm just out exploring and I'm out midday where I'm not expecting to get great photography conditions, but I still want to have a nice camera along with me just in case. I find something. And the Micro Four Thirds system can be really great for that. I've actually done a couple Micro Four Thirds videos on this channel before, which I'll link up there and down in the description if you want to check them out after you're done watching this video. First, what is the Micro Four Thirds system? And people often refer to it as Micro Four Thirds, or maybe you'll see it abbreviated as M43, but the Micro Four Thirds system is a standard put forth by Panasonic and Olympus, where the sensor size inside the camera was 17.3 millimeters by 13 millimeters, working out to a four to three aspect ratio, hence the 43. And in addition, that was built upon the Four Thirds camera system, but the Micro Four Thirds system was designed to be mirrorless from the get-go, helping make an even more compact camera. Camera. So let's dive into some things to consider if you're thinking about either adopting the Micro Four Thirds system or adding a Micro Four Thirds system to your landscape photography kit. So one of the drivers, one of the big advantages of a Micro Four Thirds system is the camera size. Because of the smaller sensor, the camera bodies can be built smaller and lighter, making them easier to carry and both from how much space they take up in a pack to just weight. Now there's various camera bodies that exist for Micro Four Thirds. I've got a couple Panasonics here to take a look at. This is a GX85, sort of a rangefinder style. Nice and small, I have the lens on here, and I've even added a grip to it, making it just a little bit bigger than it is normally out of the box. But nice, small, lightweight camera, packs down real small, and super easy to take with you if you're traveling with family or anything like that. And then they range up towards some mid-size cameras up to more of this closer to a full-size camera. This is a Panasonic G9. It's got a much deeper grip, lots of buttons, dials, options, flip screen on the back. And this one is getting close to the size of a full-frame camera. So like, let's take a look here. We take this Nikon Z7 II, which is my normal carry, and compare these two. And as you can see, this is really fairly close in size to the Nikon camera. So while Micro Four Thirds can be a smaller camera body, not all of them are. Some of them are just a little bit smaller than a normal full frame camera. But because of the sensor technology that these use, these have a crop factor of 2X, which starts to play off in how big the lenses are. So when you start taking the system as a whole, camera body and lenses, you start to really shrink down the size and weight of these. So even though this one's close to my Nikon camera, let's take a look at a couple Micro Four Thirds lenses. So like I noted, the crop factor of 2X, what that means is if you have a Micro Four Thirds lens that is listed as 12 millimeters, you multiply that by two. So it actually functions like a 24 millimeter full frame equivalent. So something that goes from 12 to 60 is actually on a full frame equivalent giving you a focal length of 24 to 120. So let's take a look at some of the size difference between a micro four thirds lens to a full frame lens and you can see where the weight and space savings really start to add up with the micro four thirds system. First up, what I have here is a 12 to 32 millimeter micro four thirds kit lens. Look at that. See how small this is? So 12 to 32 works out using the 2X crop factor to be 24 millimeters to 64 millimeters. So real close to what a 2470 would look like in the full frame world. Let's take a look at my Nikon Z2470 lens. Look at that. That's the size difference between the two. So not only looking at significant space savings with this Micro Four Thirds lens, that's gonna get you pretty close to a 24 to 70 range. The weight factor is huge. This one is obviously much heavier because it has more glass elements in it than this one, which is nice, light, and small. So that's where you really start to see some of the space and weight advantages in the Micro Four Thirds system. As we see, you can go the super small camera body because the sensor is small enough that manufacturers can build around it. If you want something that feels a little bigger in your hand or maybe has more tactile knobs, dials, buttons, then you can get up into the G9 type cameras where they're a little larger, but where you make up that space savings and weight is in the lenses. So let's take a look at what's attached to this GX85. And this is a 45 to 150 micro four thirds lens. So it's 45 millimeters to 150 millimeters in focal length. But when you turn 
turn that into the full frame equivalent, it's actually a 90 millimeter to 300 millimeter lens. Look how, look at the size of that. To do a similar range on the Nikon camera, a 70 to 300, you're getting into this lens. This is a Tamron 70 to 300 millimeter lens. Take a look at the size difference on this. The full frame lenses just take up so much more space and so much more weight that you can really pack a lot more into a smaller size with the Micro Four Thirds system, which is really attractive. So once you get down into the lens realm of the world for the Micro Four Thirds, the space and weight saving starts to become rather significant very quickly. So because of that, where the Micro Four Thirds system becomes really attractive to me in certain situations is if I'm going to be doing a lot of hiking, say I'm hiking a long distance into a location, five, six miles in, another five, six miles out, or maybe I'm expecting big elevation changes or I'm gonna be climbing up or down, or maybe I'm just gonna be out, like I said earlier, exploring on a day where I don't necessarily think the photography conditions are gonna be great, but I still wanna have a nice camera with me while I'm out exploring, just in case something happens while I'm out that I wanna capture on a nice camera. That's where Micro Four Thirds a really big advantage because as I'm finding out I'm getting older and these longer hikes and things start to take it out of me and being able to carry something a little lighter on some of those certain trips is really nice and helps me have the energy to keep photographing and have the energy when I reach my destination to photograph. And the other element is if I'm traveling. There's a lot of family trips we do where we're going somewhere and we're really not planning on doing any kind of photography trip or anything like that but I still like to have a nice camera with me. Now, I don't want to lug my big camera bag with me so that's where something like one of these little rangefinder cameras like a GX 85. I can take this. This is the 45 to 150 on here, another lens or two, and it packs down super small. It can almost fit in like a fanny pack type setup, and I can have a full plethora of focal range from wide to telephoto, all packed down a nice, lightweight, small package. Those are some of the advantages, and that's why to me, size is one of the big things that draws me to the Micro Four Thirds system for those certain situations. Now, one of the nuances to be aware with Micro Four Thirds is the, the impact Micro Four Thirds has on depth of field because of its smaller sensor size. Because we're so used to online, you know, you hear landscape photographers say, guys, you should be shooting between F8 and F16. That's going to be about where you want to play to get the right depth of field for the senior shooting. While Micro Four Thirds, the aperture in consideration for the depth of field is actually double. So, for example, say I set my camera to F4 for my aperture on a Micro Four Thirds system, I'm getting the light capturing ability of F4 a wider open aperture, more light getting in, lets me play with my shutter speed, keep it a little higher. But what I'm actually getting depth of field wise is F8 because I'm doubling that depth of field. So if you want to shoot F8 on a micro four thirds, you sort of have to do the mental math to have it to F4. Say you want to do F11, you'd be setting to F5.6 on the micro four thirds system to get that F11 equivalent depth of field. Now where this can get you into trouble is say you're out photographing and you have forgotten this little nuance and you're like, I wanna shoot at F16. So you go out, you set your camera to F16 on the Micro Four Thirds. Well, with the doubling factor, you have now actually set it to F32, which is a huge depth of field, but it also brings the diffraction problems when the light comes through a very small opening in the aperture, the light bounces and it actually can make your picture a little fuzzy. So because of diffraction, you wanna be careful shooting at super high apertures, both in full frame or Micro Four Thirds. But while you're looking at your settings on your Micro Four Thirds camera, while F16 doesn't sound a lot, should be well within the realm of possibility on a full frame, because of the nuance of doubling the depth of field, you are at F32, which huge depth of field, but the problems of diffraction probably starting to impact your images. So that's one of the nuances to be aware of. But one of the advantages of this is that setting your camera to F4 lets in the equivalent amount of light at F4 as a full frame would. The opening's the same size, same amount of light's getting in. It's just the depth of field and diffraction elements to be aware of. So important nuance with Micro Four Thirds. I see a lot of stories of people going out with their cameras and setting it up to some crazy high apertures. I mean, early on in my Micro Four Thirds journey, I went out and set my aperture to f22 because i was trying to get this huge depth of field i wasn't completely aware of the doubling factor with micro four thirds so i was essentially shooting at f44 so and as you can predict yes i got some images that oh they were okay for social media but they definitely was some diffraction in those images causing a little bit of problems so just a couple of the cons with the Micro Four Thirds system is due to the sensor size, they can be a little more susceptible to noise at higher ISO values. So starting up around ISO 3200, you're probably gonna start getting more noise in your images and something to be aware of. If you shoot in a lot of low light photography settings, then that, that could be a problem. With that said, 
we're landscape photographers, so we can set up on a tripod and we can sort of keep our ISO a little lower to help work around that noise issue. But it is something to be aware of and you may find yourself needing to do a little bit more noise cleanup in your micro four thirds images as compared to a full frame image. And then with micro four thirds, when it comes to image quality, there's still some certain advantages to full frame. You'll typically get a little bit higher dynamic range out of a full frame camera, which can put you in some limiting circumstances with micro four third. If you're frequently shooting high ranges of dynamic range, the micro four third camera is probably gonna struggle with that a little bit more. You'll probably need to expose your bracket more of your images, but again, something to be aware of. There's always a little bit of cons to some of the pros, and these are just some of the cons to some of the micro four third. And really, I would say for the situations I use these cameras, they're not even significant cons to me. They're more just things to be aware of when I'm taking the shot and what I might need to do to the file and post-processing. And despite these cameras being pretty small, they were pretty advanced for their time. And they bring several advantages, both at a hardware level and software level to the table that some of the big name manufacturers are just now catching up on in their full frame or APS-C cameras. For example, image stabilization. Micro Four Thirds has these small little sensors, which a lot of times they have the in-body stabilization, which can actually let you handhold shots you might not otherwise be able to do. That's a pretty powerful feature if you're trying to keep things light and small, because not only is your gear and equipment smaller, you're potentially getting into the realm where you can handhold things and not have to take a tripod along. Now, as time goes on, the bigger full frames and things like that are certainly to catch up on that, get their own image stabilization, but Micro Four Thirds World's been doing it for quite a while. Additionally, Micro Four Thirds seems to lean heavily on software and things they can do with their camera and software. Everything from how it can handle some focus stacking, focus peaking, to even something like this G9 that has a re high resolution mode that does multiple shots with pixel shift to actually generate an 80 megapixel file. So this is a 20 megapixel camera and it has a mode in it where you can set it up and actually generate an 80 megapixel file through software tricks and multiple shots in the camera firmware that allows you to do that. So there's some cool little things Micro Four Thirds can do, and I think they use those to help sort of bridge that gap to what the bigger sensors can do without a lot of firmware work. So that's my take on Micro Four Thirds cameras for landscape photography. I'm not gonna be leaving my Nikon cameras, my full frame cameras anytime soon, but there is a certain place for these cameras in my camera bag for certain situations. So I think Micro Four Thirds still has its relevance even today in landscape photography. Like I said, I'll link to those previous videos I've done on Micro Four Thirds cameras down in the description, and I'll probably be doing some more videos on Micro Four Thirds and how I'm using them out in the field. So if you liked today's video, be sure to hit that like button. And if you want to see future landscape photography content from me, including tips, tricks, behind the scenes, mini gear reviews, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And thank you for watching.